I'm assuming this is a 404. I make another request. I set the status to 404. Hey, it looks like a 404. Yay, my initial guess was right. Create a new view using twig view. I assign a bunch of data to it. Refer, request URI, get action, and the IP address of the request. And then I render the view. OK, this is awesome. Now I, I have a direct path here. I know I'm getting user input in get action. I know I'm getting the request URI and the refer from user input as well. And I'm passing all this into the view. So where I would go is I would look at, and hey, let's pull up Twig View and see what happens. So we open up views and we open up Twig View. OK, basically we're using Twig. We're storing all the data directly. We're not doing any manipulation to it. Simple, straightforward. And then the render just basically passes the data to Twig. Now, I know enough about Twig to know that I just need to look at the template file now to determine whether that's handled appropriately or not. So I can pull up the templates, because the templates are right in here. Uh, templates. And the template for our 404 page is in 404error.html. And OK, we have this gigantic big block of comments. It's everywhere. 404, error not, uh, page not found. And wait, what's that? You just saw it. Auto escape false. So basically, this is our intentional cross-site scripting here. We're telling Twig, don't escape anything. Just give me the raw data. URL is user input. Problem, vulnerability number one. Action, user input, vulnerability number two. Refer, user input, vulnerability number three. IP address. This, I think, is a good one to look at first because it gives you the context of, with Twig, if we got rid of these two lines, if we got rid of auto escape false and the end of auto escape, if we just deleted these, That is now secure. All those vulnerabilities disappear, which means when you're using Twig, and Mustache is the same, well, same way, and Handlebars is the same way, by default, you're secure. So when you look at the template, you're looking for things that are making it insecure. Let's look at the next error case, which is the generic catch handler, which is saying any exception that we get we want to render a 500 error page. So it creates a new Smarty view, assigns the request and the exception, so we're assigning user data directly to it. If we pull up the Smarty view, basically it's the same thing. We're just taking that data and assigning it directly into Smarty. No magic in here at all. We're not replacing anything. We're not doing any validation. So then if we look at that template, 500 error.tpl, we var dump the raw post array, and we display the exception message directly. Vulnerability one, vulnerability two. Now anything, any HTML in that post data comes out just as regular post, just as regular HTML. That's a problem. Smarty is insecure by default. That's a problem. If we wanted to secure this, we would have to pipe. You have to have something like that, where you pipe to HTML. And same thing with uh, exception get message, pipe to HTML. We, we need to tell Smarty to escape. Correct. Yeah, yeah, no. That's an information disclosure? Absolutely. No, that's a very valid point. Uh, and you definitely don't want to post out the raw data back to them as well. But just from a security standpoint, Twig is safe by default, and you have to look if it's made less safe. Smarty is unsafe by default, and you have to look to try to make it safe. There's a third template handler in this here. I see these views. I see there's a PHP view. Hmm, I wonder what that does. Basically, same thing. It captures the data, and then the render function extracts it. So all the variables in that array get turned into regular PHP variables, and then it includes the template file. 
So let's pull up the, uh, let's try the user template. Now the guestbook templates or the ad template. This you'll see quite often in um, most like uh, primitive PHP applications where they just include the template directly. Um, and you can see things like here, PHP echo ID, PHP echo location, if it's at greetings. Basically, there's a whole bunch of output in here. And looking at this template, we can't tell whether we're secure or not. Everything is just output directly. I don't see HTML special cars in here anywhere. I don't see any type of encoding or escaping being used. So the template doesn't tell me anything. So this is where I was talking about before the different techniques. Output entry, we're going to refine the output and we say, okay, let's walk back. So we're not secure at the output. We know that output is called by uh, PHP view. So if we come back here, I don't see any escaping being done in here. So we're still insecure. So now we got to figure out what's calling PHP view. Well, I'm assuming that we'll have a controller that calls that. So if I pull up the guestbook controller, all right, um, hey, the add function, new PHP view, guestbook add. Okay. So we just figured out how that view gets its instantiated. And we assign all of the data. So basically, data is um, the raw post data. We assign it directly to the view and we output it. So right here, that's your vulnerability. Basically, right from input, we've gone right from our abstraction of post to output without escaping anything. We're working our way back. We can dig deeper into this and go through everything else, but realistically, I think we found enough here. Does that make sense? Does that approach make sense? Do you guys see what I did and why I did things? Do you have any questions you want to look into here? Anything you want to go into deeper? Yeah. Sure. So one of the things I did is I opened up the temp set of uh, the views because I was looking at those before. And I see there's this PHP view which basically just includes the file. So from there, I said, okay, what files could potentially be run by this view? So I opened up the templates and I see the only template that ends in the .php is guestbook slash add.php. So I know those two connect together. So then I just try to figure out, well, what would call the add template? Well, I see there's a guestbook controller and the guestbook controller has an add method. So I was able to deduce that, that that's what happened. Basically, I worked my way back using a little bit of intuition. Luckily enough, this application is what has things that are named consistently enough that I was able to follow. And then I know my guesses worked. Try making those guesses and then try to see are there other cases that they may not work in. Okay. So again, the, one of the points I want to make here is things like Smarty and things like PHP templates are bad. And I will stand up and say that because they are insecure by default. You have to look to see if it's secure. Things like Twig and, Smart, uh, Twig and uh, Mustache and Handlebars and those types of templating systems are secure by default. You have to go in and make them insecure, which is easy to spot. Again, surround yourself by good tools. That helps in the long run. All right. So I think we can move on from this one, this example. We've talked a lot already today about cryptography and about password hashing in general. Who can tell me a acceptable way of hashing passwords? Bcrypt. What else? Script. Anyone know any others? PBKDF2 is acceptable. And also PHPASS. And I'm going to write this because 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it can be pronounced in very wonky ways. So those are basically the acceptable ways that we can hash passwords. Now, what about encryption? What do we do with encryption? Does anyone have any guidelines or anything that you think that we should look for with related to encryption? If you saw encryption in an application, what would you look for? Is it using a library? Or are there just a whole bunch of commands struck together, strung together? What are the keys? I'm not expect, I wouldn't expect you to look at and look at the actual ciphers and, and know all that and focus on it. But just look to see, are they using a library? Does the library look good? Is it, you know, do some research on the library itself. Zend is phenomenal at that. So with that in mind and that context in mind, let's take a look at a different application. Let's take a look at secure login script. And just as a side note, um, remember before I was saying anytime an application, anytime you see always within the context of security, anytime you see a tool call itself secure, that's generally a red flag as well. So yeah, spend about five, 10 minutes taking a look at that script and see what you guys can come up with. All right, what do you guys think so far? Why is signature even there? Okay, where? Okay, you have a line or some place we could point out? Yep, 49. Okay, let's try to find that. Is 292, session signature equals signature, signature equals salt IP dot hash user. Yep. So this brings up an interesting point of I believe it was you who said, what was the first thing that you said when you look for um, in code review? You said check style, code style. Take a look at this. We're inside of a function call, a method, an if statement, something, but we're indented to zero. His tab key was broken, his space key was broken, auto format on his IDE was broken. A ton of different stuff. And that makes life a nightmare when you're trying to review. Um, and that's where running, yeah, that's where running an auto uh, fixer can help. So, okay. A lot of stuff going on in this thing is pretty hard to. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's a huge issue. Um, there's a, a premise called deny first which is you assume that everything is false and you prove it's true. Um, and that's what we want in, in security sensitive code, specifically around user logins and things like that. You want to assume that everything is false and prove it's true. This code kind of does the opposite. It assumes it's true and then it proves it if it's false. Um, okay, quite potentially. Um, interesting that you brought that one up, though, because we have sanitize here, and what does sanitize do? Trims the data, HTML special cars, and MySQL real escape string. Seems potentially reasonable. I see that as a red flag, because it seems like a jack-in-the-box function. But, okay, let, let's just say that that's the case. Um, let's open up logout.php. And hey, guess what? There's another sanitized function in logout.php, which 
does something different. That's a problem. There's a third one, which was a copy of the first one. Yeah, there, there's some weirdness going on in here with that. Exactly, exactly. They're different. Anyone find anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, so basically the signature that's being computed to um, verify the session internally is incredibly weak at best. Okay, anyone find anything else? Yeah. Absolutely. There's a couple more subtle ones in here. Um, one of which has to do with a timing attack. Now we talked before about character-based timing attacks where the differences in two strings and comparing the equals between them can leak where the differences are. There's also another type of timing attack which basically is where you do a different amount of work on different branches and that can, that can leak to the user, to the attacker or something. So if we look in here, um, where is... If registered is true, okay. Again, without being uh, formatted correctly, this is really, really, really weird. Um, but so let's go here. Okay, right here. So we sanitize the username and the password, and then we run a query. Select username from authentication where username equals user. Okay, valid. This is this happens in pretty much every authentication layer you check to see if that user exists in the database. So we've performed one query. If the user doesn't exist in the database, we set registered false. And if you look at the rest of the logic, everything else is skipped, which means we just leaked the username. None of the error messages say, all the error messages in here say invalid username or password. But by looking at the amount of time it takes, we can easily tell Yes, this was an invalid username because it exited really, really, really fast. Or it's an invalid password because if it's an invalid password, it does an additional, I think it's three or four more queries afterwards, which means the timing difference between if the, if the username exists and it doesn't exist is quite significant. That's something we might want to avoid. It's a subtlety. It's not necessarily the end of the world because typically that information is going to be leaked on a registration form anyway. You know, this username is taken, do another one. But it's something to consider. What would I do? Do it all in one query. So um, why bother pulling the password out in a second query? You're querying the same table. Um, and even this login attempt, just do a simple join, issue one query for all of it, Yes, it may take a different amount of time depending on how much data is being returned, but that's a heck of a lot simpler than running four or five different queries for one simple action. I, um, this, if you may have read in the README, was based on a tutorial by DevShed. And they said, use this. This is the best way to create a secure login script. And when I saw it in 2012, I said, yeah, wait a minute, no. This is not good. Um, so one of the things that I had done, and this is just as a side note, um, what the, wired, come on, no, not USB. I basically wrote a blog post reviewing this, um, pointing out all of the different things that I could find with it, because I took it as a challenge. If you're interested, um, I'll get you the URL now. No, uh, that's the original article by DevShed. Um, if 
you just Google uh, my blog, blog.ircmxl.com, secure login script, it's the first one. Uh, security review, creating a secure login script. And basically I find, I go through how I, how I reviewed it, um, all the different issues. Uh, I think there I found 10 basic issues and then I go into detail about why each one of is an issue. It's quite a long post. Um, but it's interesting, it might be an interesting read for you. Yep. Uh, I think the majority of it. Um, I don't, I believe I go into XSS in here. Um, I don't really, this post doesn't really go into the technique of here has a code, here's a code base, here's how you go through it. It was more of, here's why I'm writing this post because it's, this is bad and here's how I know it's bad and here's how I walk through each one of the things. Okay. So, uh, do, 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 do. so let's move on. Cross-site re request forgeries. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Anyone know what cross-site request forgery is? CSRF? Okay. Sure, absolutely. So one of the common techniques, and I, I think the example is better than anything. Imagine for a second you're logged into Google. And you visit my blog. Now, on my blog, I could put something like this. So basically, I put an image where the, um, the source is google.com slash logout. Your browser would see, hey, wait a minute. I need to go render this image, so let me fetch this image from Google. If Google were vulnerable to cross-site request forgeries, all of a sudden you'd be logged out. So basically, the whole premise of CSRF is we want to make sure that two things happen. One, the user intended to do that action. And two, the user did it from your site. There's a number of ways of doing it One of the mo or protecting against it. One of the most popular is hidden data. So you create your form or your login, uh, login as a post form. You include some hidden data like a random number that you store as, on the session in the back end and then check on post that that random number is there. Basically, you're ensuring that that request came to you from that user and is valid. Um, now, there's a couple interesting parts here. JavaScript give, uh, gives us unparalleled access to do this. If I can get JavaScript onto your page, I can submit a legitimate um, vulnerability, a legitimate request on your behalf. Cross-site scripting, every single, the vast majority of cross-site scripting attacks are automatically cross-site request forgery. You cannot protect against CSRF until you protect against cross-site scripting first. So with that in mind, let's go through Prospera another open source PHP platform project in here. Spend about the next, um, let's see the time, about the next five to 10 minutes going through this one, Prospera. See what you guys can find. What do you think so far? Leaks a lot of information. Anything, any significant example? Okay. Anyone have anything else? What? Yeah, that could probably be a problem. What do you think of this as a code base? 
ugly. Okay. Uses a lot of requests. Okay. Does it seem overly complicated for what it does? No? Okay. Yep. We've kind of, with this one in particular, we've kind of started to migrate away from that procedural lump of code into something a little bit more structured. It's not quite full-blown abstracted program, but it's kind of a, a little bit of a step up from a lot of the stuff we've looked at before. Anybody find anything that you want to talk about? Anything, anyone see anything don't understand? Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. You can upload, basically the way it's configured is it allows you to upload any arbitrary file and it'll serve it. And where does it upload the data to? Hmm? Var store. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you have a file that we can show real quick? Okay. So token file. And if we open up. token file. We do, we set the name, the file name, so what, remember that came in from raw user input. And it just does a var file get contents var token with the name, which like you said, if let's say you have slash dot dot, we can do directory traversal and read any arbitrary file on the server. Especially considering it doesn't add a suffix. Awesome. Um, not is, does it do anything with this re with the reference? Does it output the reference at all? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, it's, it's also on get line 25 as well. Yes, new store from file, get reference. Yeah, but definitely wonky, to say the least. Okay. Anyone else have anything? Which, like, do you have a, a spot yeah. that you can show? Okay, awesome. Yeah, it echoes files, names. So, yep, we have a cross site tripting attack there. So, one thing I'd like to point out here the that very, very first thing that we did, um, the PHP URL shortener, was about 150 lines of code. You guys found an absolute ridiculous number of, of issues with it. But in five, it took you about five minutes to go over, or, sorry, 10 minutes to go over 150 lines of code. This, in five minutes, you just did a 1,000 lines of code, and you found roughly as many vulnerabilities, even though these vulnerabilities are a lot more intricate, they're a lot more subtle. The big point I want to get across by, say, by saying that is a lot of this stuff is practice. 
the more you do it, the more you try to find vulnerabilities, the more you look and read code, the faster and better and easier it's going to come. Um, the better you try to understand large scale systems, the easier it's going to be to understand large scale systems. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. But keep at it and keep practicing. So there's one more thing I want to show you before we break off and um, do some hands-on review of your choosing. And that is a little file from Cake PHP. Cake has, um, if you open up cake slash lib slash cake slash utility, it has a security utility. So the, here, uh, I'll put it in here. So this is the file, lib cake utility security PHP. And again, this, is, this gets back to one of the, um, the common themes I've been saying this entire time, this, all today, all this morning. One of those rule of thumbs, if your application has a class called security, you, yeah, that, that may be a red flag. Alarm bell should be going off. But let's take a look at this one. So, okay, it's a class security. And we're storing hash type is null and hash cost is 10, which right now we don't know what we're doing with it, but okay. Then we come down, we have a method for inactive minutes, which re reads a security level and converts a string into a number of minutes. To me, I don't like this because this is hard coding stuff. But again, not the end of the world. I'd rather see a separate configuration item for security.inactive minutes or something like that, but not the end of the world. Okay, generate auth key, this static function here, which basically calls hash, which is later on down somewhere, from a generated UUID. So it creates a key based on a UUID. Okay, that seems reasonable. UUIDs are universally unique. Not the end of the world. Okay. Next function is validate auth key. And let's look at what that does. Return true. Um, this is in current head, by the way. So luckily enough for us, I've tried doing as much searching as possible, and I have not been able to find any production code that actually cause, calls this function. They, they didn't call it out as a legacy. And if it was legacy, I would accept return false. But validate, I'm going to ask you to validate a key, and you're going to tell me it's valid, but it doesn't actually check anything. Uh, that's a problem. We have a hash function. OK. So we take a type, which can be null. And if it's not null, then we call self hash type, which if you remember before was set to null. So that can be null right now. If it's blowfish, we call crypt with our past and salt. OK, nothing out of the ordinary there. Otherwise, if it's salt, we read. If it's not a string, we set it to be a global salt. That's kind of weird. Salts are supposed to be user specific. OK. And then we prepend the string with the salt. Weird. If we have, if the type is SHA1, hash using SHA1, otherwise set the type to SHA256. This is weird. We're basically convoluting, bouncing back and forth between algorithms seemingly without reason. There's no documentation here that shows what the expected flow should be. It just randomly picks multiple things. Sometimes it uses mhash. Sometimes it uses hash. It just, it seems like a legacy evolution of a whole bunch of weird stuff. The rest of the file, okay, set cost, whatever, normal standard stuff. Ooh, wait a minute. We have a cipher function. Encryption. Yay. This is a fun one. So 
let's take a look at what happens here. We take a key, and then we read a seed in, wait, SRAND. Why are we using SRAND here? Hmm. For the entire length, we set j equals part of the key. We create a mask from a random mask. And we basically output a partial plain text XOR with part of the random key. Has anyone ever heard of a Caesar cipher? This is a modification on a Caesar cipher. Ridiculously bad. And in fact, if you look at the title, at deprecated, this method will be removed in 3.x. Yeah, um, this is bad. This is like horrifically bad. Again, class name security, generally alarm should go off. Yeah, well, that's what it's doing. So basically what this does is this uses a, um, a behavioral characteristic of the RAND random number generator where if you give it the same seed, it will produce the same output. So basically what it's doing is it's using the key to offset that random. So it's not just one after the next that it's using as the cipher. It's actually using a key to kind of tune that specifically. Um, but it's still bad, ridiculously bad. Hey, Rindell, we actually have a really good cipher. In fact, this is AES 256 or 128. Well, it's supposed to be, except, again, this gets down to a couple details I wouldn't expect people to know, but um, Rindell 256 is not AES. AES is Rindell 128. This was made by somebody who read and has a cursory knowledge, but doesn't know too deep. Um, where mode is CBC, which is very good. That's awesome. This is the first piece of sanity, I think, in this entire application. Then um, they create an IV with RAND, which probably isn't the best choice. Again, not the end of the world, but so far this method looks halfway decent. And then wait a minute. Oh, um, if operation is encrypt, we encrypt it. Otherwise, we decrypt it with a fixed IV. What the heck? This block right here introduces a very significant vulnerability um, in decryption. Because basically fixing the IV makes, remember I said block CBC, mode CBC? Again, not that I really expect you to know this in depth, but using a uh, fixed initialization vector, this line right here, makes that um, equivalent to EBC. Basically, it takes all security out of the cipher and makes it so if I see about 10 cipher texts, I can decrypt and get the key out of that. Bad news. Going through the rest of it is relatively, relatively simple. Um, there's really not a lot in the rest. There's definitely things I'd like to improve. There's definitely things I would say are suboptimal. Nothing's really that bad except for I think the big WTF here is definitively the return true. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only place I've been able to find it is the cake test. But still, like, really? So bringing it all together, I have one more code base that I want you guys to review. And it's something that we've already looked at one of the files from. WordPress. Go ahead, try, word, try reviewing WordPress for a couple minutes. <laughs> See if you can find any actual vulnerabilities in it. So I actually really was just kidding about reviewing it. Um, we could spend the next two days going over it as a group and not even make a dent into it. Um, 
part of that's simply because of the scale of the code base. The larger the code base is, the more effort it's going to take. But how many people here have worked with or looked at WordPress code before? Has anyone been lucky enough to never have looked at WordPress code? I will say this. Do yourself a favor. Don't. Um, it, it really, and, and again, this gets down to something you guys know. If it's not easy to read, it's not easy to audit. It's intuitive. Uh, WordPress tends to be one of the worst ones out of the popular piece of software at that. And it's not saying it's necessarily insecure, to be fair, but. So we've got about, 50, about 20, 25 minutes left. Um, what I've kind of let this up to is there's a couple more code bases in here. Um, you guys have, I'm sure, your own code on your computers. Take some of what we've gone over today, go through some of those, try to find some uh, vulnerabilities, try to find some issues with code either that you've written or some of the other open source projects in here. Feel free to ask questions, feel free to pose. The next 25 minutes are basically up to you guys to make the most out of. So I wanted to leave enough time to actually put this into real practice. So. That's actually a fantastic question. Um, with related to generic, so let me set up tethering so I can pull up some websites for you. Um, when it comes to generic web application security, um, I prefer the language agnostic approach. Learn about what the vulnerabilities are and then learn how to defend or expose them. So uh, one of the best pl places, I think, one of the best places is OWASP. So OWASP.org, I believe it is, maybe. Fingers crossed. Yes. Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it's a group of developers and security professionals. There's thousands of members. I was a member for a while. Um, you have to pay to be a member, but really that's all it is is paying, and it's donating money for operations. But they do a couple things uh, that are absolutely worthwhile. The first one that I think everybody should be infinitely familiar with is the top 10. So they do this list of the top 10 vulnerabilities every three years. They just released a new one in 2013 in June. And basically, they break it down into a list of the type of vulnerability combined with how frequent it is in the world. So in 2013, number one was injection. So that includes SQL injection, code injection, things like that. Cross um, number two, broken authentication and session management. We talked about that stuff already. Um, number three, cross-site scripting. Number four, insecure direct object references. Basically, are there privileged pages or privileged objects that you can directly access? You know, um, do you hide your admin by simply not linking to it? Things like that. Um, security misconfigurations. Is PHP configured to expose, to show all the errors on the page? Sensitive data exposure. Does information leaks like the MySQL errors? Um, missing function level access control. Again, how granular is your access? Are you really preventing people from using things in an improper way? Cross-site request forgery, we talked about. Using components with known vulnerabilities. And finally, unvalidated redirects and forwards. The cool thing is they give you this list. Well, let me click on one of them. Let me click on cross-site scripting. Hey, I get this nice, beautiful breakdown. The threat agents, it's application specific. So it's not really server specific. It's not generic. It's specific to your application. The attack vectors, how exploitable is it? Um, how easy is it to detect these kind of vulnerabilities? How much of an impact does it have? How hard is it going to be to fix? And it breaks down this really nice summary. And every one of these top 10 has this nice summary. Then you can scroll down more, and you can read, am I vulnerable? How do I protect? And actually, there's another link buried in here, which is amazing. And it has this for a lot of different vulnerabilities. It's called a prevention cheat sheet. 
which basically has seven points that you go down through, and it kind of gives you everything you need to know in a one-page Wikipedia-style page about that vulnerability and how to protect against it. A lot of them go through and have like Q&A style questions. A lot of them go through into some of the theory behind why this is good, why this isn't good, why it works, why it doesn't work. So this, I think, is a fantastic resource. Um, it's a little bit spotty because everything is vulnerability based. So there's no like progression through. There's no way you can go from learning A to B to C. If learn everything about A, then learn everything about B. Um, There's another one, I'm trying to remember the name of it. So Chris Shiflett um, does, has a book, a online book, I believe it's um, currently being written, Essential PHP Security, which tries to bridge that gap of instead of just fully deep on each one, try to give you a, um, a clean and consistent way of learning. And then Pedrack Brady, um, Where no, well, I'm prob there's another one. I'm trying to remember what it is. Um, uh, this is him. I'm trying to figure out how to get to it. PHP security. Survive the deep end, phpsecurity.readthedocs.org. His is actually, he, he goes quite in depth in a lot of it, but it's structured really, really well, and he constantly keeps it updated. So phpsecurity.readthedocs.org. Sure. Um, there's a number. Yep. So a lot of the tool, there, there are a number of different automated tools that do and give you grades and automatically detect vulnerabilities. Um, there's services that do it for you. Um, VeriSign has one. Um, my personal feeling is I do not like them. And the reason I don't like them is the same reason that you know certain doctor's tests are bad, in that a false negative is infinitely worse than a false positive. In that if you miss something, well, now you have the secure feeling that, hey, they said I'm, everything's fine, yet I'm vulnerable, so I don't need to go in and review my code because it came back and told me everything I was fine. Yet, so take Drupal 7. We recently, my previous employer, we recently ran one of these automated tools against a basically stock Drupal 7 install. It came back with over 190,000 potential vulnerability points. We went through about 3,000 of them where every single one was invalid. It was, well, I tweaked this and something changed in the page. Yeah, because it didn't match the database entry. So to me, that is a whole lot less useful than sitting down and having a couple people who are skilled at pen tests um, or skilled at doing code base audits. Yes, it's cheaper, but it's also a lot significantly less effective just because of the amount of time you're going to spend going through that list. So personally, I don't use any of them. I don't like to. I've yet to find one that works well. Exactly. 
So um, one of the things I'm a very, very big proponent of is dog fooding in the sense of if you're going to test your code, developers should be the ones who test it. If you're going to security audit your code, developers need to be a part of that practice. Because the standpoint is, if you write hard to, code, hard to test code and you throw it over the wall to QA to write the tests, they're going to hate you, number one, because you're giving them hard to test code. But number two, that feedback is never enforced. Whereas if you're the one writing the tests, you realize, hey, wait, this code is hard to test. Maybe I should write it in an easier to test way. Likewise with security, if you're part of the audit, meaning you're sitting down with auditors, you're actually doing things one-on-one -on -one with them, you can go, hey, wait a minute, this code is difficult to audit. Maybe I should change the way I write my code. Rather than this big, long, delayed feedback cycle, um, depending on the scale of the project and a whole lot of other things, you may even want to have a dedicated security person on the team who sits down in every iteration in every code that's being written and is part of the process from day one. You know, make it more of a team effort as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. That's, I don't have any easy answers to that because I don't think there are any easy answers to it. Yeah. All right, loaded question of the day. What frameworks help users write secure code? None. Absolutely none. Every single framework has issues and lets the user do whatever the heck you want. Hence, if you don't know what you're doing and if you're not trying to write secure code, no framework is going to help you. With, with that said, there are definitely tools, and I'm going to go more on the library than the framework side for a second here. Things like Twig. Twig steps out of the box and says, I'm going to help you by making sure what you do by default is false. You can still shoot yourself in the foot. You can still blow your head off. But I'm going to help you by default and make things sane by default. I think that's the right approach. And when you look at it from that standpoint, a framework really can't do that because a framework is basically saying, I'm generic, I'm doing everything. So to take the individual steps and those individual assertions that you would need to becomes difficult. For individual libraries like Symphony, like Twig, like Doctrine, things like that, where they come out and say, by default, I'm going to do everything in my power to make you safe from this class of vulnerabilities. It's up to you, though, to not break that down. Um, you know, it's like the, the saying in school. Everybody starts a semester with an A, but it's up to you to keep that A over, over, the, over time. Start off with something secure, but it's still up to the developer to keep it secure. The only problem with security from framework standpoint tends to be um, the script kitty class of vulnerabilities, meaning, so WordPress has a new hack, a new vulnerability in WordPress. Well, there's millions of places, millions upon tens of millions of sites that use WordPress, so now I can go out and blanket attack all of them. That's going to be the, the biggest um, vulnerability front from any kind of a framework or a tool. Um, as far as which ones do it by default, I don't know because I don't focus on that. I tend to focus on make sure the code that you write is secure. Don't lean on the framework because every framework I've seen that says lean on me winds up having massive, massive issues. Take a look at Rails. Um, with the GitHub attack, what, uh, hack what was it, about a year or two ago, the mass assignment vulnerability, where Rails said, don't worry about this. I've got it. You're safe. Don't think about it. And all of a sudden, people realized, well, if I just add a get parameter, I can, over, I can change people's passwords on a search form. Wait, what? Don't worry about it. Is magic is a bad thing, in my opinion. So, yep. Oh, you know, there's a whole host of issues. But um, I'm definitely a big proponent of magic is horrific, magic is bad. So from that standpoint, I wouldn't even trust the framework, even if it said, do it this way and I'll help you. To me, that's kind of voodoo. I don't know. I, uh, that probably doesn't really answer, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Sure. Be careful, though. Because, like, so one of the main arguments that people make for using frameworks is, hey, it's good code made by experts, and it's reviewed by a lot of people. Well, look at WordPress. WordPress, I, I personally know a couple WordPress developers who are absolutely very, very intelligent. I'm not trying to impugn individual intelligence. As a project, their stated goals and everything tend to conflict with those types of goals. Um, and the clarity and the cleanliness of everything. So don't assume because something is open source it was made by an expert. Don't assume because it's popular it's good. We have plenty of counterexamples to both that really, really show uh, strongly that that's not the case. With that said, don't blind trust, but don't blind not trust either. There's kind of a happy balance. Trust, but only trust as far as you can, you can help hand, uh, validate. Such as? Intrusion detection programs. Um, so I'm a proponent of defense in depth, which basically means have layers and layers of defense. Every layer can be broken. Every layer will be broken. It's impossible to create a 100% secure system. It will not happen. The only secure system is one that was not built. If it exists, if, and it's valuable enough to somebody, they will get in, they will get your data guaranteed, hands down. Even the NSA has been breached in the past, or well, years and years and years ago, at least that we know of. The point being, you can never get 100% security. So everything becomes a trade-off. You add layers of defense, intrusion protection, uh, things like honeypots become useful in trying to defend in depth, but they're not necessarily something you want to rely on. So it's not, I have this so I can forget about everything else. It's I build layers, I put a firewall in front, I put rate limiting on it, I do intrusion detection, I make sure my, my code is safe, I use mod security, but I make sure that I ha don't have SQL injection vulnerabilities. You put mitigations in place, but then you don't trust those mitigations and you put more mitigations in place. I, I guess that's, the way I would I would say that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting to look at, like Apple. Apple consistently, year after year, has the most vulnerabilities of any major operating system. You know, Android, iOS, Windows, Linux. They consistently are number one in terms of number of vulnerabilities disclosed by a large margin. But what makes them good is that when they do get the vulnerability, they react quickly. And I think that's more important is being able to, once you identify a problem, you don't just sit back and say, oh, well, okay, I'll fix that in six months when I get to it. Being able to identify and react. So have something like Tripwire running on your servers to detect, hey, files changed. One of the techniques I used for a long time was I had all my public facing web, um, web stuff in a Git repository that was checked out on the server, and I had a cron job that ran every couple of minutes and did a Git status, and if anything ever came up modified, it would fire off emails, intrusion detection, basically. What, fa what changed and why did it change and let you try to follow up? But how you react and how you deal is infinitely more important than how secure you are in the, in the first place. Anyway, anything else? I don't think you can test security. Um, if you were write a, to write a test, it would be akin to a blacklist in that you say, this is a case I'm going to test for. All that that test will tell me is that that case is, is protected. It doesn't tell you that you're protected against that vulnerability. It doesn't tell you that that code is working. It just says that particular flow with that exact input is working. Could it be useful? Absolutely. Is it significantly useful? I don't know. Yeah? It's, I haven't seen anyone do it in a, in a way that works. 
So that doesn't mean that it can't be done. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Come up and try it. And if you can, if you can show a project that that works well on, that'd be awesome. You know, it, part of it is, part of my hesitation there is um, bad tests are worse than no tests in the case that you make a change to fix a bug and if you have to fix, change a thousand tests to fix one line of bug, your tests suck. So I would rather have no test than really, really bad tests. I've only ever seen those kind of tests be bad tests. If you can do it in a clean, good way, by all means, do it and pro prove it wrong, write a blog post on it and I'll 100% support it. That's, you know, it's a case of we're continuously learning over time. I just haven't seen it done well. Yeah, you guys are talking about like automated tests. Mm -hmm. You should definitely be doing tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should definitely be doing review. That's the whole point. But yeah, like unit style tests. Except from a regression standpoint, which is absolutely a valid case. I just don't know if it's worth the maintenance overhead. It may be. Depends on the application. Depends on a lot of things. So, all right. Um, lunch is outside. And thank, every, thank you. Um,